I've been a writer writer for about 20 years. I've been a writer in the furry fandom for about 15 to 16. I became a full-time writer about two and a half years ago, and that's what I do now. I just write all the time, forever. But <laughs> um, this is writing one-on-one, -on -one, so this is more uh, how, like how many people here have written any kind of story, any any writing, any. Okay, so you all have dipped your toe in the work. Has anyone ever uh, completed a book or a big project? 20, 50, okay. I have one I'm working on. Okay. Uh, so I do mostly bigger projects, but I do a lot of short stories too. I'm also a commissioned writer, but that's for another panel, commissioning for fun and profit tomorrow. Um, so what we're going here right now, what I like to kind of do for this panel is just kind of go through the basics. Uh, what I do, kind of less like, you know, like, oh, grammar and stuff like that. Like, you can get a good grammar program or an editor. Uh, I'm more of kind of the techniques and, and stuff like that. So, before I begin, though, I always like to ask, like, does anyone have anything they would like me to talk about that they came in, like, I want to know this, because I have a general plan, but, yes. Educational. Like, uh, instructional, like, telling you about something and how to do it. Like, you would say well, that's the what this is. No, like, doing that writing. Oh, writing. okay, doing, edu doing educational writing. I'm pretty good at fancy stuff. Uh, I'm working on this graphic design book right now. <laughs> uh, educational, I mean, all writing is kind of the same via the two categories. You have your nonfiction and your fiction. Nonfiction features facts. Fiction features narrative. You want to make sure your facts are right and not fiction. You want to make sure you have a good narrative in fiction. I am 100% fiction. That's what I do. Mostly fantasy uh, with a quite a bit of sci-fi. So, basically, uh, when you start out writing a story, it's always good to have kind of an open concept in mind. Um, there are people who swear by the detailed outline, the pages upon pages of notes, the cue cards everywhere, and that does have its place. If you're thinking of doing a novel, that is good for making sure you don't forget where you are. Because there's nothing worse than getting halfway through a book, leaving it for a week, coming back and forgetting where you were going with it. And I've done it before. But when it comes to kind of just planning, starting out your writing, starting out whatever story, whether it's 5,000 words, 50,000 words, or, or so on, uh, you always want to have kind of a, a more open concept. You want to have that idea in your head. You want to kind of formulate your characters. You want to make sure that you have kind of ability to breathe because one of the biggest things that I've heard from other writers uh, who are stuck is I have this idea in my head. I I want to put down this outline, but then I put down the outline and want to change something, so I go back to the outline and then go, then I don't like the first part of the outline, and they get into kind of an outline paralysis or idea paralysis, where you're so like wrapped up with this idea being the perfect idea, having it ready in your head, start to finish, you're just going and be done with the book. That usually doesn't work. <laughs> I've rarely had a story where I had the idea for beginning to end in mind and then that ending be the same by the time I got there. Your stories have a certain amount of organic quality to it. Your brain doesn't think, you know, rigidly like that when it comes to fiction. That's nonfiction, that's perfect. Nonfiction, if you got that kind of thing, you're set. Uh, but for fiction, you have to kind of keep it organic because a lot of, you see, like, you especially read the books which have a lot of rigidity to it. A lot of, like, Samuel went to the market. He saw a cart on his right. He went forward and saw an apple. Like, you can tell they plan those steps, but you kind of get, like, a little, like, come on, get on with that, right? You're, like, a little, a little bored with it. Uh, whereas when you're kind of writing with just a concept in mind, you can kind of, like, all right, what's... What's Mark going to do? You know he has to get to the other end of that street. But, you know, he can look at a car and he's kind of walking. And then you think, oh, what if he saw a duck? You know, and because it kind of spontaneously came in your mind, it's going to, uh, it's going to feel more spontaneous on the paper. Like, it actually happened on the paper. Um, and 
disclaimer, I usually give this disclaimer in the beginning, but I kind of forgot. What works for me might not work for you. So if you take my advice and you get 100% stuck, take my advice, throw out the window. Because there are times when like stuff I've heard I've tried and it just doesn't work. There's times I've heard stuff I've tried, works beautifully. So, you know, if, if you go home or if you start writing and it's like, oh, Sarah told me to do this and it didn't work, that's, that's fine. We're, we are all different, and especially creative types. We all work very strangely. I know people who have the most rigid ritual when it comes to writing. It's, you know, 7 a.m., one cup of coffee with one sugar, get to the computer at 7.15, open, you know, open it, make sure the font's in 12 point, Helvetica, if it's anything else, they're just jammed for the rest of the day. Like, whereas I just kind of like get up whenever I go on my computer, just start writing. Like, and you know, the whole outline versus, I don't use outlines, but I know a lot of people like outlines. And to them I say, go for it. Some people need that, that structure to remember stuff. I remember stuff pretty good just in my head. But that's kind of the, the general feel you want for your stories. Um, it, really, it really talks to your audience when you kind of put it down as you're thinking about because they're thinking with you. You know, you're, right, you're not writing for you, you're writing for them. They're the ones who are going to interpret your book. And again, everyone's different, but people usually have kind of the same general mindset. They want to follow along they kind of want to look over the shoulder of your character, see what's going on. Unless you're writing a different, you know, point of view. First person, they want to write in the brain. Third person, over the shoulder. Third person, omniscient. Oh, God. But you have to, you know, depending on what you're writing, they, they like to be in a certain mindset, and then they like to stay in that mindset. But that's kind of my, so that's general just feel of the book. Now we can get into, uh, kind of more of the specifics of, of the writing um, when it comes to your environment. So the first thing, concept. You want, good, you want a decent concept, you want to keep it organic. The second thing is your world. You know, your world is what you're going to portray to your audience. You want it fleshed out enough that if something arises in that concept that you have, you can figure it out pretty easily. You do not want to over plan. The death of a story usually comes from over planning or over complicating things. But at the same time, you also want to make sure that, again, it's good enough that if you come across something that you weren't quite expecting or if you changed it on the fly, like with the concept, you want to be able to have that, that wiggle room that, oh, you know, like I went to the next township, what kind of battle would they get in? Like for a fantasy story, what kind of fight might they get into? They wouldn't get into a fight with a heavily armored legionnaire army. That's weird. It's a, just a township. Probably like local ruffians or guards or something like, you know, the local guard ship. That's using your environment to help craft your narrative. The, the more you kind of have that in your mind, the more you can definitely keep it to where your narrative comes into play. You kind of go as, or build it as you go. <coughs> I was trying to hold back. <coughs> Excuse me. So, one big thing about world building, the probably, I think, the biggest, some people argue with me on this, but the biggest thing about building your world, remember your rules. Nothing will take an audience out of your book faster than if you make a rule and then break the rule. The biggest thing that you can see when it comes to that is actually what this con is all about. Time travel. There have been more books that I've read where they do a time travel thing into there in the past. And then it's like, we can't go back to the future. And then suddenly like 30 pages later, it's like, all right, let's go back to the future. I'm like, yeah, I thought you said you couldn't do that. Like, <laughs> what's going on here? What, like, and you, it, that's exactly how your audience is going to react. It's going to break it right out. You're going to be like, I didn't think you could. They'll flip back, they'll try and figure out like what's going on. You don't want to confuse your audience. You, you never want to confuse your audience. So make sure when you make a rule, 
you, you take a mental note of it. And a good rule of thumb when it comes to building a world like that is keep it general. Your audience doesn't have to know all the rules that you're creating. Your characters just have to know the rules. So when they come up across a piece of narrative that you're doing, you know how they'll react. Audience doesn't have to know. They don't care. But your character knows, and that's what's important. Because if that, ever, if that scenario ever comes up again, that character will react the same way, and your audience will be like, yeah, of course. You won't break the rule. It's very important to keep your rules straight. Again, that's part of that over-complication thing. Yes? I know, I'm working on a fantasy story in the form of a blog, so each page is a new like episode of it. Um, one thing I have is actually a blog page that's not published, that I have on each episode what stats and stuff change. And it may be stuff the character doesn't know, but stuff that becomes important. Say, you get stabbed, you take X damage. Does that make you unconscious? Does that kill you? Or do you just shrug that off? And that wouldn't be something the character would be like, yeah, I have exactly 219 health, or I only have 23 health. Okay. They so might know they're low or high, because the way the world is, worlds are, but... You, you have what I like to call GM notes. I'm a huge D&D player. I have yes. notes on what's going on uh, that my players will never know about. Those are GM notes. So you can definitely have GM notes when it comes to your story, too. If you, especially, especially, like, time travel is a big one, but anything, especially you have something you want to bring back later. Callbacks are one of the greatest things I've ever seen in a story. If you do them right, your audience will be like, ah, and you'll leave an impression on them because they're like, I remember when they said that thing back 55 pages ago. And if you don't think they will, I guarantee you they will. Most people will remember a callback simply because, as long as you do it right. And to them, there's nothing better than having something that you've read before come back. It's like a little treat, a little reward. Like, hey, you got this far in the book. Remember this little thing before? It's important now. So... I love using callbacks. You know, obviously, it's up to your own personal taste on that one, but uh, just for that. Speaking of details, though, it kind of segues perfectly. Uh, there is a concept that I recently learned the name of, and I'm not sure if I got the name right. Maybe. But it's called Asimov's Gun. And the ru that rule is, if there's a gun that you say is on the table, by the end of that chapter, that freaking gun bear get used. And I have a kind of a more general, you know, thing for that, because that's a little thing. But it's basically, you want to put enough details in your story, but you want to make sure that they're always important. Uh, it is kind of like D&D, &D too. You never put out something that is not going to be important unless you're running a red herring, but that's a different concept. Generally, you want to make sure if someone, walk, like if your character walks into this room, they want, like if there's a dude sitting there, walks into the room, sees a dude, sees a desk, bunch of chairs, that's probably where I would leave it. You don't have to say, he walked into the room, there are six lights on the side of the walls. The carpet is a weird, weird pattern. There are X chairs, and they don't need to know all that. If the focus is... The dude in the middle, that's where it goes. Uh, a trick that, oh, yeah. I actually um, saw a YouTube, well, we read a story about something like that, where the GM's telling, they was describing the background, making a fanciful, mentions a dolphin, the entire party goes and hunts down the dolphin instead of staying off track. Because that one slight mention, that was like part of the background image completely threw everyone off and made them chase after that. Yes, that's what we call party fixation. <laughs> I've been a D&D player for a long time, I know like all, <laughs> all the little things, but yeah, you, you, it's the worst thing when you've like, and then there's a rock, we gotta find out what that rock's all about. And, <laughs> and to a, a lesser extent, you know, your audience is waiting for a payoff. If you have a sword in the room and that sword never gets used, they're gonna kind of wonder why you mentioned it. It could have just been there, or you could have just been like the walls were filled with ornate medieval weaponry to connote, or to you know denotate that oh this room like the person in this room is dangerous or or something like that. You can use your descriptions to your advantage to convey emotions. 
it's weird when you read a book and they're like, this room feels ominous and scary. And when I went over here, I felt a little sick and there's, I, I'm angry at this area over there. Like, you, you don't have to, to mark out the emotions. Use your environment. That's a great way to not only give yourself more elaborate settings, but also to then have it used. So when I gave the ornate, you know, weaponry example, a, a bunch of images probably came up in your mind. And, like, for you over there, not to put you on the spot, but when I said walls filled with ornate weaponry, what did you think? Swords and halberds. Swords and halberds. See, he's getting the mental image. Swords and halberds everywhere. How about you? I did. Similar image. Similar image? Yep, so everyone will have a similar image to that. And as you think of swords, you always think, well, not always, but you think, you know, battle, you think danger, you think defending yourself. You th there, there are emotions that are attached to objects that, you know, chairs, sitting, comfort, relaxation usually. Uh, whenever, if I have like a big boss or like a, a big guy, you know, usually since I'm a furry, it's a, you know, an anthro lion with a full mane sitting behind a huge mahogany desk filled with golden trinkets and you know, that conveys power and wealth. And I want, I, like, I want the character and the audience, as soon as they walk in, to know this dude is not to be messed with because he has power and wealth. So that is using your environment to your advantage to convey emotion. Emotion is very hard to convey in writing. Artists kind of have it easy in that regard. We all see anger in people's faces. We all see, you know, those kind of emotions. Boom, you put it on a piece of art, anger. For the wordsmiths of the world, we have to put that image into the audience's mind. And if you do it wrong, and they get the wrong image, they're going to get confused. And what do we never do? We never confuse our audience. So it's always important to be subtle, but also make sure that you get the point across. Because you also don't want to hit him over the head with it. Same way no one likes being confused, no one likes getting the, like, all right, little Jimmy, you know, you go over here and you'll get your treat, and then you go over, and then you go, you know, 50 meters to the left and you get in there. Like, we are adults. We don't need to be led around like that. So, unless you're writing a children's book, then that's perfect. Um, yes? Uh, you mentioned that you, basically, you've worked on commission before. Mm -hmm. How do you balance uh, your enjoyment of it? with actually getting your work done and avoiding burnout and just, you know, avoiding uh, not enjoying what you do. Well, I actually cover that in my Commission for Fun and Profit film, but <laughs> to kind of give you the, the Cliff Notes version of it, uh, I always write what I enjoy, or I try to. Um, I'm a huge lover of transformation and furry and uh, other things in this 13 plus panel I can't, you know, say. But if you, you know, if you're writing what you love, then, you know, if someone, especially, even if someone else gives you the idea, then you can go ahead and keep going. You'll still get burnout. I, I, I totally, even if you're, like, writing the thing you love the most, and if you write, it's like eating chocolate ice cream, if you like it. You, you keep eating chocolate ice cream every day, all day. You're going to get sick of it, and you're going to want anything else. But... You know, variety is the spice of life, and basically it's just try and keep your, try and keep your head above water. And, and like I say, I go into this way more with commissioning for fun and profit, but um, yeah, you gotta, do, you gotta do what you love. And to go a little more into the commissioning thing, if you're doing this for money, my suggestion is don't do it. <laughs> if you're doing it solely for money, don't do it for money. Don't just do it for the money. Um, you need a certain level of passion for the craft. Uh, otherwise, you're going to do exactly what you said. You're going to burn out, um, especially when, when money starts getting involved. Uh, the first time I took money, I was absolutely terrified. And I did kind of burn out a little because I'm like, just because I worked myself up into such a frenzy. Uh, but like I said, that's for, for commissioning for kind of profit. Um, but yeah, so anyone else have any questions while we're kind of in the segue period? Anything? All right. 
Uh, so we covered the concept, and we covered the world, covered the characters, and then we get to the plot. The plot is, by and far, one of the most important things in your story. I mean, you can have great characters, you can have a wonderful world, but if your plot sucks, no one's going to read it. And that is basically the adventure. Um, that is what your character, whoever it is, is going to go on from beginning, probably to end. I've seen people kill off their main characters midway. Wouldn't recommend it to start out. <laughs> but, you know, going from beginning to end, when it comes to an adventure, uh, excitement's not always uh, the big thing. It doesn't have to be, you know, Michael Bay gun, you know, gunfights and car chases. Because with those, especially like, I'm thinking like, I'm trying to think of a movie where that is, but I can't at the moment. But if it's all gun, you know, gunfights, car chases, explosions, things like that, uh, you'll actually acclimate your audience to it and they'll get bored. Um, there is such a thing as a, you know, increasing tolerance for anything. So what you need when it comes to plot is you have these, uh, oh, has anyone ever seen like the little graph where it's like beginning, like action, yeah. climax, conclusion. It, right-ish. Uh, <laughs> my graph would look more like, woo, 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 and then maybe put a little one out at the end there, but. <laughs> You always want to make sure that the setting keeps changing. And by setting, I don't mean your world. I just mean what what's going on. You, you have to have a period of rest in between at big action scenes. If you're doing a big you know, exposition dump, which I wouldn't recommend, then you have to have something to liven it up. When it comes to plot, you can really do anything. Um, I've never seen a plot that was just bad because someone, because it was bad. Usually it was poorly executed, or they went, you know, in different directions, or they tried to do too much. But I've never seen an item where, or a, an idea where I could go, well, that idea will never work ever in the history of writing. I've never seen it. So whatever idea, you know, comes into your head that you want to write, by all means, go for it, you know. Don't ever, especially don't ever let anyone say that, you know, your idea is stupid. I write hardcore furry porn. I mean, no one would think that that would be, uh, you know, something that anyone would read for more than three minutes. But I've had books where, where like full, like 50k books, where people have read from beginning to end, and they said, I know it's porn, but I couldn't stop reading. And I... Like, that's the best compliment that I could ever get, is I, you know, I came in for the porn, I stayed for the plot, you know, and that's, that is, like, my end goal when it comes to this sort of thing. I'm not a porn writer, I'm just a writer who happens to write porn. Um, so, and, you know, some people actually do wonder about that, like, hey, why, like, you know, what, what is, why are you, like, having people actually read your stories? And, you know, my guys were like, oh, you know, two pages, done, you know, like that. I'm like, well, let me see. And it's pretty much PWP, which is, called, which is plot? What plot? You know, think Dime Store Novella. Dime Store Novella, there's a thousands upon thousands of them. And literally everyone is the same. There is actually a specific formula out there that they stick to when they write dime store novella that they do not deviate from. So every book is pretty much a carbon copy of one another. But, you know, they sell it because of board housewives. <laughs> but, you know, you can... In <coughs> Excuse me, yeah. And you don't want to definitely be formulaic. You definitely want to put in a dash of suspense. You want to put in... Uh, action, but you also want to put in character growth, you want to put in uh, everything that you would see in like a, a movie or a book that would help your character grow from who he is in A to who he is in B. And I say that because if your character is the same from A to B, you have done something wrong. Because your character has to change from A to B or else the journey means nothing. And 
it doesn't always have to be good. Your character can turn from a nice guy into an a-hole. And he might be a, you know, a villainous, creep, uh, villainous person by the end. That's perfectly acceptable. He has changed, and not for the better. Likewise, you can have uh, a, you know, a nice person, but then they become jaded, but then they become stronger for it. They've changed, like, they faced the horrors in their path, and then they didn't come out better for it, but they came out stronger for it. And not all of your challenges have to be bad, either. It could be a great thing. Uh, there, oh my god, there's a psychological scale that I just forgot the name of that I had in my head up until now. Uh, but it rates levels of stress. You know, the highest being death of a family member is like 98. Uh, at coming at like 92, marriage. Marrying someone you love causes a 92 on that stress scale. Because even though you are happy, even though you are in love, you are facing a major life change, and that scares the crap out of most people. So it doesn't have to be bad. It just has to affect your character in some way that they grow from it, whether for bad or good. And the whole and the journey doesn't always have to center around one character. Uh, it could be two or three. You know, you could be like J.R. Tolkien and do like fifty. But <laughs> as a general rule of thumb. I found that the most that you should really ever have in a book is six. Um, I don't have any like scientific basis for that, but I've tried writing more than six. It's it's pretty pretty gnarly. Uh, six is pretty gnarly in itself. Uh, you have to make sure that your audience actually remembers what the hell is going on with your timelines. If you introduce you know Pablo Rubio and you know, John Smith, and then John Smith gets 30 pages, and then, oh, I have to go back to, and then there's a new character, and then three more characters, and, you know, you're three-fourths of the way through the book, and then Pablo Rubio comes back, you're like, who the hell is Pablo Rubio? Go back, go back, go back, have to find, like, it through the other ones, and again, you never want your readers to read backwards, that only works in manga. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I know the plot pattern never actually worked for me. I've, and I've never, never got anything done. I started working on books. I tend to do it more of, uh, you have these characters, and then we kind of see what happens. And that's kind of why I've been doing the blog format, because that actually lets me produce things. Instead of start writing, get bored, because I have no one to talk to about, because no one knows what's going on and then end up writing something else. Okay. Um, well, I actually have something kind of on that that I was going to uh, for the narrative aspect or the, you know, with the plot. Uh, and that kind of also goes back to what I said before about having a loose concept. So, what you're talking about is letting your characters write your story for you. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do all the time. I'm a very free form, like I said, I don't like plot outlines or stuff like that. Commissioning, you kind of need it, but you still get a little. In any case, I have my characters, I have an idea, the concept. I have usually like a rough idea of the end, like, oh, I kind of want to do this. And of course, at the beginning. From the beginning to the end, though, I kind of just push them along. I, I'm a very big DM about it, actually. I push them along and let them kind of react to the world. I throw challenges in their path. I think about how to overcome it. And then they keep going. Um, I used to write very ABC, you know, keep going from that point to that point. Until one time, it was a particularly long book that I was trying to write. And I got from A to B, just fine. B to C, just fine. But when it came to C to D, total log jam. I could not put down another word to get from C to D. Even though I was going just fine in those other points. And it took a long time for me to realize this, but I wasn't really listening to my characters. And I realized at that moment, my characters would not go to D. My characters from A to B to C have evolved to the point where I knew in my mind, subconsciously, that it was against their very character to go to D. I had to go to E first and then skip around to G 
and then maybe if I had time, come back to D. And when I listen to my characters, and when I let them kind of lead me along on what they were going to do, I wrote way better. And from that on, I kind of, that's kind of what I preach of listening to your characters and making sure that, because your characters know what, they're kind of alive in a way. They know what they can do. They know what their morals are. You gave it to them in the beginning. You gave them all the skills that they have. You gave them, oh, yeah, have a good one. Uh, you gave them uh, all the skills that they have. You gave them all the ambitions, all the goals, all the flaws. And then you set them loose in the world to go through your plot. And then something came up and they said, no, it's not, that's not me. And your brain recognized that. So you have to work around that. So whenever you hit a huge roadblock um, and you're writing a particularly long narrative especially, ask yourself, why isn't my character willing to do this? Why doesn't my character feel like that's the best plan? Why is it so hard to believe that my character would do that thing? And you'll find, more times than not, that your character is trying to tell you something. Or trying to tell you something better. Like, ah, I would do this thing because it takes advantage of that thing you gave me earlier. So... Char like listening to your characters, just like listening to your world and making sure your world works the way it does, is a huge benefit to you. Um, again, won't work for everyone, but I highly recommend at least trying it once. Just try out a five thousand word story. Just set up a nor like a, just a random concept. Pick something off a website. Whatever you want to do. Make some characters and just not have a plan. Let loose. You know, just let them go. Throw a challenge in their way. See what they do. It's good. It's a good way to help build up uh, a little bit of improvisation, as well as uh, kind of narrating on the fly like that. <coughs> so, does anyone have any questions about characters or anything that I've said before? Oh, perfect explanation. Uh, oh, can I get a time check? In? I just brazzed that guy for going over for like 10 minutes. I want to do the same thing. It's 837. 837? Yeah. Okay, so it's close, but all right. Um, so, you know, I've been talking a whole lot about structure and, and stuff like that and things that I've done. Uh, talking about, you know, writing 101 and stuff like that is not just, you know, what you do to write. It's, it's how you write it, too. I am a very unusual writer when it comes to that. Uh, as of late especially, I have gone three weeks without writing a whole lot. I actually am a game developer too, so I just work on other stuff. And then for one week, I shut off all electronic devices. I, except for my computer, obviously. And I pretty much just cut my net and write for a week. This last time, I wrote 157,000 words in a week. That works for me. Uh, the reason why I don't go too much into this is because you have to find what works for you. I can't tell you what's going to work for you. I can give you some suggestions. Uh, I can give you some help, seeing things that have helped me. Um, but in the end, you are you. You are your own person. You have to feel out, you know, some people might like classical music to listen to. Some people might like hardcore rock. Some people might not like any music. I know people who just sit in silence, just the clacky clack of the keyboard, and that would drive me absolutely crazy. You know, I have to have something in my mind to keep me going forward. My recommendation, though, just out of ease of, of word's sake, try to find stuff that doesn't have lyrics, because if you're listening to lyrics and trying to write, you'll transpose a lot of times. Uh, same for watching television. Uh, if you're hearing conversation in the background, you will put in words that are going on there and you will not realize it. I've done it before. I've gone back and I've had whole sentences that came from the television and not from my brain, even though I thought it came from my brain. And I'm like, what? Like, I'm talking about a jury selection. Now we're, is how to make macadamia fudge. What the hell? And oh yeah, I'm watching a cooking show in the background because I just want something in the background. It's like, oh, well, that doesn't work. So I, I actually, 86, all lyrics, all 
you know, I listen to soundtracks, OST. I like stuff with a beat that's a little higher. I think it gets me writing a little faster. But again, that's up to you. Uh, as far as your office space, you know, stuff like that. Uh, how many actually are would love at the end of the day to be a full time? You know, just yeah, one, one and a half. Two. Yeah, you know, and that and that's totally fine. Uh, how many would like it just as a hobby, as something that's you know, if you got the ideas in the head and got one back to you. Okay. Yeah, and you know what, no matter what, it's it's all up to you. But uh, when it comes to your office setting when you're doing it professionally, for me I have to make sure that I'm comfortable because I'm doing it for a very long time. Um, and time length usually it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, try to um, go for at least an hour or so if you're gonna write and try to keep distractions to a minimum. Uh, when you switch tasks, it takes your brain about 20 minutes to refocus on the tasks you're switching to. So, especially when it comes to something very creatively oriented, like writing. So, if you have your writing and then you check an email, you just reset your brain and lost 20 minutes. You know, you're, you're revving it back up. You have to rev it, you have to rev your brain up a little bit. Uh, once it's revved up though, you know, it should come pretty easy. But uh, keeping distractions out like that, that, that's a great way to do it. Uh, make sure you're not distracted by hunger, tiredness. Um, you know, don't go writing for 24 hours straight because <laughs> by the end you're not going to recognize your writing. You're going to have a lot of weird sentences that don't make any sense. Uh, try, try to refrain from the use of alcohol or other substances. Um, the whole, uh, like... Uh, I forgot the author's name. The one that used to, uh, Ernest Hemingway, the old Ernest Hemingway way, like a you know bottle of bourbon and a typewriter. Um, I would not do that though, especially if you're just starting out. Uh, clear mind helps you focus, helps you create. Um, you might think you're doing better, but you probably are. I've known very few people who can pull off writing under any sort of substances. Uh, and then, let's see. As far as content, you know, again, it's it's really up to you. Find content you like. Um, if you have content that you are experiencing, even better. Uh, it it's really easy to write about breaking your arm if you've broken your arm. Don't please, for love of God, don't break your arm to figure out how to write how to break your arm. Just guess. But uh, if it, you know, when it comes to real experiences, real stuff that you've learned or studied. That will help you even if you're not attempting to do that. I am a biologist by trade. Uh, I used to be a scientist, that is what my degree is in, um, especially in microbiology uh, and a little bit in epidemiology, so viruses, stuff like that. When I write a TF related story and the TF is spreading or is infectious, I use that epidemiology knowledge to replicate how it would actually spread in an urban environment. It's something that probably, you know, most people wouldn't realize, but it brings an actual sense of realism to it. You, you don't realize how much you actually know about stuff because you kind of learn it passively. You just absorb it. You absorb facts every day, all day, just facts in your mind. And when you read stuff, your brain is taking those words and then building you a little mental movie in your head. And the more facts it has, the better that movie is. So if I'm writing an ep you know, if I'm writing something that's got actual epidemiology traits, if you ever watched The Virus or some weird movie like that, you know, they'll talk about stuff like that and you'll relate subconsciously to that and you will have a better experience because I use actual procedures rather than just you know, pulling stuff out of my butt and just saying, oh, that's how it spread away, you know. Uh, unless the movie you did was bullshit, which there are movies like that out there. But in any case, uh, I'm trying to think of what else to cover. Uh, does anyone else have any questions at all? So, all right, perfect. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see. So, I'm trying to think of any other good, useful stuff. I have one. 
and then I forgot it. <laughs> uh, when it comes, oh uh, man, I just had a good one too that I was going to say. Don't be like Twilight. I don't know. <laughs> like, um, your, your aim is to be better than Twilight. Your aim is to be better than Twilight. Uh, <laughs> and I know, like, I usually bring this up at least once because Twilight's a travesty on most things, but especially werewolves and vampires, but the writing on is also not very good. I read only a few pages and I couldn't even stomach it. And then even worse is when they made Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, <laughs> but that, and that is kind of like, because I've had, I have had people come up to me like, well, what about Twilight? Can I just be like Twilight? And Twilight is a prime example of it's better to be lucky than good. Um, you, you have this, this book that I call a book, loosely, and it's just a lot of like weird exposition dumps and a lot of stuff like that, and you know, I'm trying to make heads or tails of it, but it's got sparkly guy with a vampire and blah. And that's what made it work. So, you know, your concept can, you know, make your book work and carry the whole thing. But if you have all the stuff that I was kind of talking about, you're going to have a solid book. And that's what you're aiming for. You're aiming for a solid book. Oh, now I remember what the thing was. All right. <laughs> I knew if I talked long enough, I would do it. When it comes to your world, I'm going back to the world for a second because I forgot this. When you make up stuff, it's proper nouns. And the name and you know names of things, stuff like that, and descriptions of things that don't exist. That is it. And a lot of I still get a lot of people are like, no, Sarah, that I like to no. Mm. If you especially if you're just starting out, do not have a glossary in the back of your book. That will piss people off. I know because it does to me and a lot of people I know. You don't want to call a fork a Google Fleck because then when you call, oh, can you pass the Google Fleck? I guarantee you, Maria's like, what the is a Google Fleck? Like, then they have to look in your glossary. He's like, ah, oh, it's a fork. By the time they get back, they're not going to remember what the hell they were even reading at that point. So when it comes to stuff like that, it's names, proper names, like the University of St. Martin's Angels or something like that's fine because it doesn't exist. You're making up a place or a city, you know, the city of Blarnesville. And those are fine, but don't start naming stuff with other stuff. People know what a spoon is. It's again, it's that building that mental picture box in your mind. Do you say a spoon? Everyone's going to know that's a spoon. If you say a Skurgelberg, they're going to be like, what? Like, so, when it comes to making up stuff, uh, make sure it's, you, you use reality as your base. The more you use for reality, the better your book's going to be. Yes. Um, actually, I do have a, well, what about though if you're trying, I am writing a book, and with the book I kind of do a little bit of talk, kind of using animals, anthropomorphic animals, as metaphors for some very um, touchy things like racial stuff. Sure, sure. And, Instead of using the N word, I use the term void to kind of replace it because it's kind of to make it sound like it's the same sort of connotation as the N word. Would oh, that, sure. Would that um, be... Well, and actually, anthropomorphic creatures are a great way to convey sensitive subjects. Um, I have, I am currently writing, I haven't finished it yet, a book about um, a world where euthanasia was kind of like pushed through and it's a more normal thing. And that's a very sensitive subject. With anthros, people can read that and kind of take a step back and have that step of separation between them and that sensitive subject. If it's just a person, if it's just a dude, um, you know, someone's going to read that and they're going to put. We like putting ourselves in the main character spot, and that's going to cause a lot of un, you know, a lot of nervousness, stuff like that. If it's an anthro fox dude. The brain's gonna be like, wait, that's not me. That that guy that's happening to. I'm fine, you know. So, but uh, when it comes to substituting words that might be offensive or stuff like that, that's perfectly fine. That especially if you're using world of like anthros, because with anthros, I realize I haven't talked much about first, but <laughs> when it comes to anthropomorphic and stuff like that, you have to change the rules a little. It's like future. I love hard future sci-fi and fantasy because I can change a lot of rules and no one's going to call me on them. When it comes to the world of anthros, 
you know, you can make up stuff with anthros that you couldn't do for humans. Humans don't have claws, humans don't have horns or feet. We know we're furries. So, calling someone like, you know, you hard hoof, you know, talking to a horse or, or something like that, that would make perfect sense in a world where it's full of, like, stallions who, you know, be like, stop scratching the floor with your hooves, get some hooves protectors or something like that. You know, that's a problem that you had to solve in that world. Yes? Well, with my sword, for example, another fan kind of used to kind of allude a little bit to is kind of like another or a little stem off to another subject instead of using the term quack or, you know, kind of another issue. Um, I use the term uh, using wolves, snow sniffer, to kind of be like, you know, kind of alluding to that they like to snort drugs. Right. Good. Oh, yeah. It, like I said, it's, per it's perfect to use animal characteristics because, again, you have that step of separation and you have something that, you know, isn't used, you know, call, calling someone, you know, cracker is, you know, kind of offensive to people, but if you call someone, hey, you snow sniffer, like, did, did anyone get offended by me saying that to you? No, of course not, because, I, like, oh, what? Like, I go out and, they may allude to cocaine, but, you know, they're not going to be, like, they're not going to be hardcore on. So when it comes to that, yeah, it's, it's good to substitute things uh, of that nature. And when you come to anthros, it's easier to do it that way. Um, you know, with that in mind, don't go overboard. Right. And don't, don't, you know, same back where I said before, if, if you have, like, a very specific kind of slur in mind with an anthro, uh, you have to denote early on that that is a bad thing. Otherwise, your audience will not get it. So when, that's why it's hard to, you don't want to, you know, make up a whole lot of words for other things. Uh, because you have to then denotate what kind of motion to attach to it. Really easy if I, you know, when someone punch them, like, oh yeah, anger, violence, you know, stuff like that. But if a cat goes up and hisses at someone and stuff like that, that's bad example because people know about it. But that's anger and, you know, rage, but for cats. So you have to be like, and they hiss, and everyone went, <gasps> you know, like, oh, there's such a bad thing. You know, you have to signal the flag on what, on what that is. Thank you very much. I get it. I get it. Can I check this? I don't. What's that? 852. 852. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I just, I didn't want to go over because I just ragged on those crap guys for going over. So, uh, one last thing. Uh, and this is near and dear to my heart. Please, for the love of God, don't write in second person. Yes, do not write you. <laughs> do not write you. We don't um, care about. We don't care about the sheep. To be fair, there are two exceptions. Two exceptions only that I've found so far, and that is hypnosis scripts and choose your own adventure novels. Other than that, please, 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 do not write you or the second person perspective. And here is why. Here's the best example. Uh, let's say you know. We have a character, Go. Uh, the, you walk into the convenience store, and you look around, trying to see if there's any danger, go over to the Coke, or go over to the sewing machine, you fill yourself up a Pepsi. Yeah, Pepsi. Anyone who hates Pepsi is out of that story. And when I said before that people like to put themselves in stories, you are putting them in the story for them. And if you don't have exactly, you know, their... It narrows your audience too much. Then you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna get a very narrow audience of people who like Pepsi, which is very small because Pepsi sucks. Hey, <laughs> fuck you! Uh, <laughs> Coke's better. <laughs> Boy, I'll I'll fight you over that. I just want to go into a restaurant at one point, sit down, and like. And, oh, and, we have Pepsi problems. No. <laughs> yeah, they say like uh, like a Coke's Pepsi. Okay, just no, no Pep. I don't know what. No, no Pepsi. Pepsi. I hate this. Ah, I hate going. you. But that'd be kind of your audience. With my mom. <laughs> With my mom. <laughs> but I like to put that out there. Don't don't write in second person. It'll save yourself a lot of headaches. If you write in second person. God help you. I won't ever read what you do. But <laughs> uh, any really last minute questions? Nope. Perfect. Well, I would say then. Thank you for coming to Writing One Hundred and One. I hope that you enjoyed yourselves. Oh, it is a little tough. Enjoy the rest of your con. Yay! Yay! Next is Resident Evil 2? No! We are doing Castle Crashers! Oh, Castle Crashers! Woo! I'm getting my suit. <laughs>
Silver Gato Man, he bought me a coffee. Silver Gato Man, here is the song for thee. He likes to video all the panels at the cons. You should go and watch them, whether they are short or long. Silver Gato Man, you video that's not a jibe. All of you go to his YouTube channel and like and subscribe.